Good afternoon, everybody. We're streaming live today on our YouTube channels in the trenches and First Star Media Group. And want to make everybody aware during the season, every week that the Bengals play, we're going to be giving Bengals merchandise away. Tickets, jerseys, helmets. I mean, we're talking First Star or First Class merchandise because First Star does everything First Class, as you all know. So keep your... Uh, Keep your eyes peeled for those opportunities and make sure you take advantage of it. Um, this live stream is is mostly discussing the cut down day, and I I just came from uh, Paycor Stadium. I had to, I did a couple of uh, breaking down tape on Logan Wilson, Jermaine Pratt, two inductees for the Ring of Honor, Boomer Esiason and Chad Ocho Cinco Johnson. Uh, so I, I saw some of the cafeteria workers and other people down there. And it's a tough day for everybody. They're sad. There already are players in there to come to some of those people to say goodbye and thanks for everything they've done for them. It's a, it's, it's a tough day. It's a very tough day for Zach Taylor and assistant coaches to tell some young player that uh, you're, I know you gave me everything you had. I know you're, you had a dream and, and the dream's not over, but Right now, it's uh, it, there's a little pause, you know, until the next opportunity presents itself. That's a tough thing to look a young man in the eye that that gave you everything, and and it just didn't didn't work out. Just a numbers game. That's what it boils down to, and it's going to be interesting to see how many young guys. Uh, there's going to be guys reclaimed. Obviously, 16 practice squad players are going to be re reclaimed when they clear waivers. How many guys are going to get opportunities on other practice squads that the Bengals don't bring back to theirs? Um, how many members of the Bengals practice squad are going to be plucked by other teams to go to their 53-man roster? The Bengals practice squad could have some depth to it because here, here's some guys, based on my eye, uh, the way I've done my roster, and I'll tell you how I ended up doing my roster here, but they're going to be defensive linemen like Raymond Johnson, had himself a great camp. In fact, Raymond Johnson, the Bengals are going to reclaim if, if he's there to put him on their practice squad. And he may end up playing in the early stages of the season because Joseph Asai has a high ankle sprain. And a high ankle sprain is a four- to six-week thing. There's still two weeks till the first game. But if it's a six-week deal, I mean, there's a month there where we're going to be looking for somebody to uh, take that roster spot. Raymond Johnson could go from being waived today to being on the 53 man or 48 man roster for the uh, Cleveland Brown game. That's life in the National Football League. That's how crazy this can be. But Raymond Johnson, uh, Jeff Gunter, um, Dominique Davis had himself a good training camp at the defensive tackle position. Those three defensive linemen on your practice squad, it's pretty high cotton right there. So I, th you know, the Bengals are going to have some depth on their practice squad as well. This roster is pretty good. How long will guys be on the Bengals practice squad? Will the Bengals have to bring anybody up from their practice uh, squad to the to the 53-man roster because of the injury gymnastics like the Osai injury that I'm talking about? Um, Smith, Deontay Smith, shoulder injury. His doesn't seem to be that as, as serious as Osai's might be. So I think that he'd just be deactivated. The other thing you'd do with Osai is instead of putting him on a pup list, and, and bringing uh, somebody like Johnson off of the practice squad, you can just have him on your 53 men roster and deactivate him every week for four weeks. You know, there are five deactives that on the 53 men roster that you have to do every week to get down to your 48 man roster for the game. And he could be, you know, handled in that regard as well. So, bottom line is the Bengals were very, very fortunate in terms of injury around the National Football League. There's a bunch of other teams that aren't as fortunate and they're having to play injury gymnastics with their roster. The Bengals, they they, they were fortunate, didn't have a bunch of serious injury. Roster spots were won based on play, based on snaps, not based on, oh, we're going to have to try to slide this guy through and I hope he clears waivers. And then once he does, take this guy off of a pop and put him on this list. I mean, all of that stuff didn't have to happen this year, which is good. It just was all about how this guy play. Did this guy play better than that guy? Yeah, he should be on the 53-man roster. Is he a practice squad candidate? Maybe. Or we just let him go and he goes on and, and continues his football life elsewhere. I mean, all those things are going on right now. And it all is happening today. I mean, 
there weren't cuts along the way. This is the first year where they went, you go from 90 players to 53 players, boom, one felt swoop. Honestly, better for the players because some of these players that are trying to show themselves in the last preseason game or practices during the season, because teams will, they'll, they'll trade tape, practice tape on guys, um, you know, if they have good relationships. And those guys want as many days as they possibly can to show they belong. So the NFL decided, let, instead of having different cuts at different stages, because of injury problems that occur during the regular during the preseason, leading up to the regular season, why not have as many bodies as possible? Let all these guys go to just one big cut, and and don't uh, and, and and don't you know, <laughs> basically shoot yourself in the foot unnecessarily. It's good for the players, good for the organization. So I think that's the reason that it was uh, it was done that way. Here's how uh, I talked about it during the last preseason game. How I thought the roster might break down. Let me just review it again. Um, I, I just w- went 53 man roster, 25 offense, 25 defense, three specialists. And then my 25 offensive uh, players, 10 were offensive linemen, three were tight ends, six were wide receivers, two were quarterbacks, four were running backs. Defensively, 25, 10 defensive linemen, five linebackers. 10 defensive backs for 25. And then the three specialists, Evan McPherson, Cal Adamitis, and Brad Robbins. Those are the three specialists that uh, that were on my final 53-man roster. But let me go through the guys that I had um, for, for, uh, for the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, the 10 offensive linemen, Orlando Brown, Cordell Volson, Ted Karras, Alex Kappa, Jonah Williams are the five, Deontay Smith, Cody Ford, Trey Hill, Max Sharping, Jackson Carmen. That's the 10 offensive linemen. And if there's any other position group, um, say it need an extra defensive back because if a Wouzier has a setback, they need another defensive back, they could I could drop down to nine offensive linemen and keep that extra defensive back if necessary. The wide receivers, six wide receivers, Jamar Chase, uh, Tyler Boyd, obviously, T. Higgins, obviously. Uh, Charlie Jones, uh, Yosevash, I should say, who we're going to be talking to in a in a uh, in a, a podcast here shortly. Trent Norwin, but that, that those are I think that's six six guys there. Um, quarterback, a guy named Joe Burrow and a guy named Jake Browning. Why at, at the running back position? Joe Mixon, Trayvon Williams, Chris Evans, Chase Brown. Okay, defensively, ten D linemen: Sam Hubbard, DJ Reader, BJ Hill. Trey Hendrickson, Cam Sample, Tupo, Zach Carter, Osai, Miles Murphy, Jay Tufele. Tufele had himself a hell of a training camp. He's my tenth tenth defensive lineman. If you if you know if uh, if you only go on nine, I probably would you know cut it down to four defensive tackles, which would be tough. But I got five and five, five edge guys and five D tackles, five linebackers: Logan Wilson, Marcus Bailey, Joe Bocci, Jermaine Pratt, Akeem Davis Gaither, multiple. Linebackers in that group can play all three downs. The Bengals are fortunate. A lot of teams in the NFL don't have any linebackers that can play all three downs. Logan Wilson, Jermaine Pratt. Logan Wilson started off as a cornerback, Wyoming. Jermaine Pratt started off as a safety, North Carolina State. These guys can play the run, can play the pass, can rush the passer. Uh, Akeem Davis Gaither's a three down player. Marcus Bailey's a three down player. Bocce. I mean, they're, they're very fortunate. <clears throat> Defensive backs, 10, 10 of them. Mike Hilton, Jalen Davis are the two nickels. Uh, at the cornerback position, Cam Taylor Britt, uh, uh, Chidabe Awuzie, DJ Turner, the second, DJ Ivy uh, at safety, Nick Scott, Jordan Battle, Dax Hill, Tyson Anderson, six corners, four safeties on the 10 defensive backs, very young on the back end. Mike Thomas is, in my mind, I'd vote for him for president. <laughs> Mike Thomas is one of those guys. He's a hell of a leader, hell of a football player. He'd be on my practice squad. If he will do it, I'd love to have him on my practice squad. I think the Bengals' practice squad is going to be one of the deepest in the National Football League as well. I mean, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of good players on that, uh, on that practice squad. But Okay, so that th- I threw out my, my roster, which I did it before the, uh, the final preseason game in my hotel room. Took a flip card here, Redskins, Bengals flip card, and, and did my roster. Um, the one thing that, that I thought about the night before the game was, okay, 
six and four at defensive back again. If Ch if Cheeto is having trouble and he's not quite ready for that opener, maybe go seven uh, corners. Might have to do that. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think he's going to come out firing. I think he's going to practice really well this week as well as next week. The other thing is how young they are on, on special teams in some areas. How about for, for a punt team? You have a second-year snapper. You have a rookie personal protector because Mike Thomas took every snap, every single personal protector snap last season, Mike Thomas took it. Now you got Jordan Battle, a rookie personal protector, and a rookie punter. Pretty young, you know, and you're up, and I'm thinking, okay, you're up in Cleveland, close football game, fourth quarter, crowds going nuts, play clocks winding down. You got to punt the ball. You're backed up. You got to punt it out of there. And all of a sudden, they show a funky front that you hadn't practiced against all week, and that happens. And you got a, a Jordan Battle, a, a rookie punt, a rookie personal protector in his first game in that type of a situation. But you got to you, you, you got to trust the fact that this guy is football savvy, football IQ. He can handle it. He's younger. He can run. You know, and Mike obviously is on the back nine at 33 years old. He doesn't run like some of these younger safeties, and they went young at the safety position. Nick Scott's going into his fifth year. Everybody else is a young blood. I mean, second year, first year players back there at the safety position. You have to have. You're going to be young at some position. I'd rather be young at safety than at corner. I can tell you that if you had if you had to make a if you had to pick one and and uh, had your druthers, so there's a lot that goes into this, and this this isn't even considering what other people are letting go, but there's not as much movement as people think. I mean, there's there's always going to be a player or two that's going to get a lot of buzz and a lot, but we're talking about thirty players on thirty. We're talking about a thousand players that are going to be all over waiver wires and other in being evaluated. There's going to be video going all over the league. I mean, it is going to be the wild, wild West all day today. And at four o'clock, they have to announce their final roster cuts, but all through the night tonight. And then tomorrow, other things are going to take place. That's when they're going to make the claims. They have to clear waivers for 24 hours before they can brought, be brought back to their practice squads. And that's when, you know, people can claim others and, Oh, geez, I thought I was going to be able to get him back on my practice squad. I didn't think anybody would claim him. And then sometimes two or three teams will claim a guy that you thought you might be able to slide through. So it's going to be an interesting 24 to 48 hours, no question about it. And you got a lot of young guys and veteran players, too, that want to extend their career and young guys that want to get a good start to their career sitting by their phones, <laughs> just waiting, just waiting for information waiting for a positive call and hoping they don't get a negative phone call. But boy, guys, there were guys down there that I saw going in that, I, that I'm like, okay, he's going to his meeting. How the meeting with Zach. Zach's going to look across him at the de at his desk and say, young man, I can't criticize anything you did. You gave me everything you had. Just wasn't quite good enough. That's a hard thing to say to a young player that uh, is talented you know, but that's life in the NFL. It's it's very, very competitive, to say the least. With that said, Dave, let's roll. What do we got? We got some, uh, got some good calls here? Well, the first thing we got to do is congratulate Yash. He got a job. Did he? And now he's planning on making a trip to Cincinnati All so right. you can show him the first Star Logistics Studios and give him the personal tour. So he said he didn't know if that's going to happen in 23, but definitely in 2024. So we look forward to the Ash coming to Cincinnati and visiting us. All right, Yash. I, I I have my 2024 calendar, and I've already got, like, the NFL draft. I have dates highlighted, you know, for the 2024 year. I've already got, you know, birthdays for family members, my anniversary, all those dates circled and, and put notes in there. Yash, as soon as I find out when you come to Cincinnati, you're going in my book, Yash. you got to have it. Here we go. It'll be a big day, man. So we're going to start with Bengal Babe. Her question, what about another quarterback? Will they go for a more veteran backup like a Colt McCoy, maybe like a Jake Fromm, uh, or like the Greer, the Greer kid that got cut from the Cowboys who had an excellent preseason? What, what's your thoughts on the quarterback position, Dave? Money. It's not going to go very expensive. Trying to sign Joe Burrow to the richest contract in NFL history at the quarterback position. You know, uh, people were saying, man, Jacoby Brissett, yeah, what a great backup. Wouldn't he be a great backup? That's yeah, $8 million bucks. 
and he's got $2 million in incentives. <laughs> you you, you, you uh, get what you pay for, man. You know, so um, I, I do think that if the Bengals stay with two quarterbacks, it, 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 they'll have a third on, it, on, on the practice squad. There's no question about it. But if they go into the Cleveland game with just two quarterbacks available to them, they don't bring another quarterback off the practice squad and bring him up to the 53-man roster, and he doesn't count on the roster, if they don't do that, that tells me they're a full speed ahead with Joe Burrow, full speed ahead. So I, I think the next couple of days in terms of what they do with the quarterback and then uh, the practice week and, and even right up until the game, are they going to have only two quarterbacks on their roster for that Cleveland Brown game, or will they have a third? And again, the league now has a situation where you can have a third quarterback that does not count against your roster, like an emergency quarterback. You can do that. So we'll see. We'll see how it all shakes down. PB's ghost. My question is, should the Bengals go after some pretty good low cost cuts? James Robinson slash Jared Patterson Gaskins, or again, quarterback from or McCoy. And the other thing you have to realize is if Joe Burrow uh, gets hurt, or, or doesn't have a, uh, a, a comfortable feeling playing against the Cleveland Browns, and he feels like, I'm hurting the football team by being out there. Any of these guys you're talking about, hell, they're not going to know the offense. You can't – I don't care who the quarterback is. He's not going to come in a little over a week before the opening game and, and have total command of the offense. I mean, he'll understand con concepts and all that, but you have to unlearn and relearn terminology. They'll, they'll have such a skeleton – of, of plays for a quarterback, particularly a younger guy, they'll, they'll, they'll go in to a situation if they have to play this guy, whoever it might be with such a limited amount of the game plan that it would, it would be very, very difficult. You, you can't expect miracles out of guys, pick a guy up off the street and in a week and a half feel like he can go out and compete against miles Garrett and that Cleveland Browns defense and do a job. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's pretty dicey in my mind. That's, that's very rare. A guy like Colt McCoy, there's not many concepts that he hasn't seen. But again, it's what's the Bengal way of doing it? What's the Bengals language? What what what's what's going on with with all of these things? How do they get to these uh, form? Everybody gets to formations differently with motion and other other types of things. There's there's all kinds of nuances. And I'll tell you right now, there is no doubt in my mind that one thing Joe Burrow's doing because he's done it ever since he's been quarterback with the Cincinnati Bengals. He is in on the game planning for the Cleveland Browns. He's not waiting to have a game plan presented to him. Joe goes in with the coaches. He's in there with Zach. He's in there with Brian Callahan. He's in there with Dan Pitcher. He's in there with the other, other coaches. And he's involved. You know, he's, he's, he's like, I like this. I like this package. I'm not quite as keen on that package. And there's no question I'd be shocked if he has not been in on some of those meetings, because they're, they're already putting together things, concepts and ideas that they think might be uh, worthy of, of uh, putting into a game plan for the Cleveland Browns. And there's no, no doubt in my mind that Joe Burrow is part of that dialogue. No doubt whatsoever. We want to make sure everyone understands you can watch this live stream. You can see videos that not just from lap, but also Joe Goodberry mm -hmm. and, uh, our, our, our buddy Malik Wright and his group on the First Star Media Group YouTube channel. And at some point in time, Lapham will be converting everything over to that channel. And uh, it's a slow process, but it's it's something we're, we're trying to do because we're trying to build a stronger channel. First Star Media Group. Here we go. Just keep that in your mind. Injury issues, they need another solid grinder at running back. What's your thoughts about the running back position? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that they feel pretty good about the running back position. To me, I think Brown, uh, he's got an ability to change direction now. He can make you miss. And the other thing about him is that 5'9", 5'10", he's stout, well over 200 pounds. He's got a low center of gravity. He's got a good body lean. He hides behind his offensive lineman and explodes. Uh, he his pad level is just, it's, it's down. He's a, he's a little bowling ball, man. He's a little wrecking ball. I, I was impressed with him. He also is catches the ball well out of the backfield. He wasn't asked to do that much at Illinois. He can do that. Chris Evans had, has had 
some injury issues, and then he was ill for the last preseason game. Travion Williams was dealing with a sprained ankle. I mean, they've they they've all proven that they, that they can uh, they can perform. Joe Mixon's back and ready to roll. I mean, they've got some depth at the uh, at the running back position. There's no question about it, and and I think the fact that they're in my mind they're going to keep four when the fifty three when the 53 man roster is is finalized and the 25 offensively i think it's going to be those uh, those four running backs will probably be on the initial stages of uh cut down to 53 i i, I really feel that way one nation underground dave do our safeties worry you at all like i was saying the age maybe um and and that that was obviously the the biggest question mark, you lose two veteran safeties, the caliber that uh, that the Bengals had back there and Jesse Bates and Von Bell, both not only <laughs> really good players, but team leaders, and you lose them both at the same time, that's a hit. That's a hit. There's no doubt. But, you know, Nick Scott, is, he's, 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 in my mind, there aren't a whole lot of safeties in the NFL that run better than Nick Scott. This kid can run. Dax Hill, his second year in the system, and, and – Lou Anarumo was wise enough to play him everywhere last year. He played outside corner. He played slot corner. He played strong safety. He played free safety, although there's really no true strong and free in, in Lou Anarumo's schematic. But he, he had Nick Scott, all, uh, or Dax Hill, I should say, all over the field. And now he understands why he has to do what he does in a safety position because he un he knows what the other guys are doing and, and how – his safety piece fits into the big puzzle. So, and he's very intelligent back there. Um, Jordan Battle, rookie, Tyson Anderson, second year player, missed his whole rookie year because of injury. And I'm saying, like I said earlier, they are young. Dax Hill, second year, Tyson Anderson, second year. They were drafted in the first and fourth round in last year's draft. Jordan Battle, second round in this year's draft. Nick Scott is the, the old blood going into his fifth year. So, yeah. I do think that, 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 like I said earlier, that is the spot where there's probably the biggest questions. And like I said earlier, I would rather have it at safety than at corner. Um, and I do think that, that these, these guys understand, like I said, Dax Hill, because of all of his, his position versatility and the fact that he lined up and took snaps in, at them. And he's, he's got football intelligence. Tyson Anderson has football intelligence. Jordan Battle, Saban said he was the smartest football player ever coached at Alabama. He said it was like having a coach on the field. So it's not like it's not like these guys are dodo birds or anything close. Uh, Nick Scott's a very intelligent football player as well. But they're young and they haven't played together. So, you know, all of that has to has to take place. And they're gonna have to grow up fast because, you know, up there in Cleveland, Watson can throw it. And Cleveland's uh, got some skilled players, and they're going to scheme, and you, they're going to be battle-tested right from Jump Street up in Cleveland. Then when Baltimore comes to Cincinnati, there's no question about it, in the very physical, tough AFC North. Dan the Man. A couple things with Dan the Man. First, first Star Media Group, the new YouTube channel. Do I have that right? Yes, it, it's, it's new but not new. We're just transferring things over. It's the home of Joe Goodberry. Uh, Malik Wright's bringing his stuff over, and then eventually we'll also be adding uh, in the trenches to that as well. Um, Dan the Man also had another one in here, and I want to go to and Dave. This, you're gonna have to put on your your memory here because 1983. He says, "Got to ask." Lap was rewatching a Bengals <laughs> line game from '83. You recovered two fumbles that preserved the touchdown and a field goal in the game. Cincinnati won 17, nine. Did you get a game ball for that? You know that it, it was crazy because I mean, I, I, I recovered an onside kick in high school uh, and, and, and ran it, ran it back about 30 yards and just had a bunch of guys hanging off me. I was so much bigger than everybody else in high school. And that, so that was kind of a fumble. And I, I hadn't recovered a fumble. I, I recovered a fumble for a touchdown in high school, and then never, didn't have any fumble recoveries that I can recall in college. And then all of a sudden, in that game, two of them pop up there, and they're like just sitting right there for me. Uh, and I think I know I did get plaudits after that game, re recognition from the from the coaches for being heads up and 
um, you know, in, in, in being aware, football awareness is what they were talking about. And so I did get some kudos for that, but I don't recall a game ball. <laughs> I don't recall getting one of those. Dolores is always with us. We appreciate her being there. First, your interview with Darren Simmons was award-winning. Oh, thank you, Dolores. Loved it. He mentioned Cedric Pierman. Wow. Is there a player now on the special teams that you see valuable like him? He was exceptional. And uh, Cedric Pierman, the thing about Cedric, totally unselfish. I mean, he would just give of himself for the betterment of the football team. And a guy that reminds me a lot of Cedric Pierman, because they were both personal protectors on the punt team, Mike Thomas. And, you know, my, my feeling, and I made the statement during the last preseason game, knowing that it might be Mike Thomas's last last game for the Bengals this year, I hope he signs on the practice squad. I think he's going to. But I said, you know, any roster is better with Mike Thomas on it. Mike Thomas and Cedric Pierman, very, very similar. And what they did for the football team, even though one was an offensive player, and Cedric Pierman was a capable running back. You know, he's he knew he was never going to be like, you know, a star, but he was very, very solid, very, very sound. Never made an assignment mistake. Always where he was supposed to be, when he was supposed to be there, and given every ounce of effort he possibly had. And that was that's Mike Thomas on the defensive side of things. That's why both guys lasted a long time. Uh, I'm not sure Cedric got double-digit seasons. He was up there, though. I know he probably played at least eight. And Mike Thomas, more than a decade in the National Football League. And a lot of the reason why, not only the tangible of what they gave you physically, but the intangibles of what they gave you leadership from a mental standpoint and all the all the things that go along with uh, being part of a football team. And the common denominator, again, for both of those guys, man, you talk about unselfish football players, just great people. Unbelievable. All right. We're going to go back to Dan, the man again he says lap. What's the key to not repeating the slow start we had last year. And are you optimistic? We'll get out of the gate in better shape this year. Yes. I, I, I honestly believe that, um, you know, the, the big key is how is Joe Burrow going to be last year? Obviously the, the, the problem that we, that the team had, in the uh, Baltimore Raven game, it's turnovers. Went minus five in the turnover department. Joe Burrow had four interceptions and, and he lost a fumble. And he had five, five giveaways. That's not Joe Burrow, but he was trying to play, you know, very, very quickly after having an organ removed from his body and losing like 15 to 20 pounds. I mean, it's unbelievable he played like he played. This year, is it, it, Joe's not in that type of situation. He had a, he had a tweak in his calf a calf pull, but Joe Burrow is stronger, um, in, in unbelievable shape. I mean, he looks, he looks amazing and he is, he's throwing the heck out of the football. He's got his arm strength is as good as it's ever been. Probably it's continuing to climb his accuracy is pinpoint as always. He's always on point there and he hasn't taken any hits. He's not beaten up. He's not nicked up. He's taking every mental rep. Like I said, he's meeting with the coaches. He's watching tape a game. I mean, he's he's all in every aspect of it. And it wasn't like he wasn't when he was injured with the ACL and the um, – actually, it was ACL, PCL. It was a terrible triad, the knee injury he had, and the appendectomy. It wasn't like he wasn't in – but physically now, I mean, he's peak, tip-top, prime. So and, – and I've said this before – over the last few years, when I've watched him in like the May OTAs, mini camps, that type of thing, after the draft, after about the second day, he looks like I'm like, man, he looks like he's midseason form. Mentally, he's making unbelievable reads, you know, seeing everything before it happens, getting the ball out to the right places and throwing the ball with the great accuracy and velocity. I'm thinking, man, this guy, he never, he never lets himself fall dip you know, from a skill set standpoint. So in my opinion, he's going to be in really good shape against the Cleveland Browns. And it is, it's a matter of um, time on task with some of the younger receivers. But again, in April and May, and, you know, right up until the injury at training camp, he got a ton of reps in with all those guys, you know, 
that were drafted right after the draft. Um, Charlie, Andre, I got the rookie wide receivers. I mean, Joe got into a pretty good sync with those guys and, and he'll fall into it quickly again. And with the big three, those guys have so many reps, so much time on task together. They could roll out of bed and be ready to, to play in a national football league game. I mean, I, I, I don't think I'd be, I, I'd be stunned if Joe Burrow doesn't play at a very high level against the Cleveland Browns stunned. Yeah, no surprises. The Bengals are going to be releasing Drew Chrisman, yep. uh, Trent Taylor. Yep. Uh, so no surprises there. Dave, let me ask you this. Every player at some point in time, I've known a lot of guys that have played in the league. They have to face that reality. You're real. Uh, you've mentioned it many times. Coach Paul Brown would say, hey, be life's ready work. for your, your life's work. <laughs> yep. You got to go to your life's work, son. What, what, what's the mindset of, because you're still very young. And what, what's that mindset when you know, hey, the game's done? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it all depends um, what your situation is. Some guys are, are married young with kids. When you have a family and there's pressure on you, you know, to go find something else quickly. That's why it's such a different game now because of the amount of dollars we're talking about. I mean, bottom line is back in the day in the, in the 70s, early 70s and into the – you know, 70s and 80s, when you got let go from professional football, if you hadn't done anything in the off season in terms of um, employment that you could fall into, I mean, you were you were done. You were cut off. And it wasn't like you had built up a huge reserve because it wasn't big pay back then. Guys did have off-season jobs because the NFL wasn't huge pay back then. You, all, you had to have an off-season job to – continue to pay the bills that your wife and family were in, and you were you know, rolling up. So now with the amount of money now, I mean, guys that are on the going to be on the practice squad, it's $12,000 minimum a week times 17 weeks. Do the math. You're talking about over 200,000 up to uh, 19, uh, no 17, 12,000 a week up to 17,000 a week, it's almost 300,000 bucks, a little over 300,000 guys are making quarter of a million bucks on an average on the practice squad. That's what stars were making. <laughs> I mean, stars weren't making that in the seventies. By the time the eighties rolled around, they were starting to make that kind of money. Um, but now that's what practice squad players make. NFL minimums are, I don't know, five, six, 700,000 a year, whatever the heck it is. So you do have a little bit of a buffer. And I know, I mean, everything's ridiculously more expensive now than it was in the seventies, but from a proportional standpoint, <laughs> the average NFL salaries and compensation has skyrocketed higher than the cost of living has skyrocketed. So guys do have a little bit of a little bit more time, a little bit more bridge time, but it's a shock. It's a shock to your system. And and um, you've done it since if you were playing peewee football, you know, your body clock has been doing it for almost your whole life. Then all of a sudden, boop, it's interrupted. Uh, and some guys have real problems adjusting to it. That's the other thing. Uh, the Players Association is has done a real good job over the years. I know back when, again, the infancy of the Players Association, guys that would struggle mentally making the adjustment had real problems in some cases, tragedies in some cases. Um, and now the, the NFL Players Association does a good job of helping helping players transition and all that sort of thing. But yeah, like, like Paul Brown said, you know, he, he would get up there in the last cut and he said, gentlemen, I'm, I'm giving some of you guys the opportunity to find your life's work earlier than you thought. And you try to spin it positively, but it was a crushing blow, man. Guys were crushed about it. There's no doubt. Again, we want to mention during the season, every week, the Bengals play on in the trenches and the first star media group, YouTube channel, and make sure you be checking out First Star Logistics Twitter and also DL in the Trenches, Laps Twitter, um, giveaways. And I, I, I was talking nice. to the powers that be before we got started today, Dave. I want to win some of these things. Tell what we're talking about signed helmets, signed jerseys. You and I both know we've been doing this now. This is our third season together. And when they do it, First Star Logistics, 
always does it right. They, you know, if, if their whole thing is, if we're going to do it, do it first class, you know, don't, don't, don't do anything on the cheap, man. <laughs> if you're going to do it, do it right. And they always do always do it right. And yeah, they, honestly, trying to take care of you. You guys are the reason we're here doing this. So we want to take care of you a little bit. We, we have fun doing it. No question. It's a good time had by all. All right. Disco potato is back. <laughs> About At it. what point should we start raising eyebrows with bro contract not being done? Cause there was, you know, here the other night, there was a lot of these tweets because the stadium was green and people yeah, right. were all of a sudden assuming that, sure. oh, well, they must have signed Joey B. This is like the Pope. Right. Um, not yet. I, I just, I hope, and, I, you know, I have no knowledge, but I'm just hoping, uh, hoping against hope maybe, but I'm hoping that the contract and Joe Burrow are both done in terms of Joe being able to go and the contract being executed and signed on the dotted line by all parties concerned before week one love to see it before uh that cleveland game and and you know the thing with joe's contract that you have to understand is he's got years left on a contract it is an extension so you know there could be four or five years added to his current he has years left on his contract so um i'm telling you by the time all is said and done adding in what's left on the contract and the money that Joe Burrow is going to get in addition to, it, it's going to be 300 million bucks. It's going to be 300 million bucks or more, maybe 325 million. And it's all going to depend on how it's paid out. That's, that's, that's a, a, a big factor. How much up front? Uh, what are they going to do with that money up front? I mean, there's all kinds of things uh, in the final stages of a contract, but the thing is there has to be give and take on both sides. Um, if, if an offer is made out there, the other party has to respond, and then you have to respond to the response. There has to be open communication, open dialogue, and hopefully that's what's going on because I'd love to see it happen. I'd love to see it done. love to see it consummated by that first week, man. That would You talk about a celebration. Joe Burrow, not only back for that opener against the Cleveland Browns, but he's also back for not only the remainder of this contract, but four or five more years, whatever the heck it's going to be, that dog would hunt right there. Yeah. As long, uh, going back, knowing Joe since he was in high school, he's not even thinking about it. He, he's more concerned about being on that field against the Browns than anything uh, else. I I agree, but I'm talking when you're talking through a million, Dave. I don't care who you are, <laughs> it's gonna hit your mind at some point, man. There's gonna be some point during the day where it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> whatever, whatever the deal. That, may that's be, where crazy. Mom Robin <laughs> keeps him keeps him level. Yeah. Tom Jones says, I believe when T Higgins is signed, then Burrow wants to make sure T gets paid because if he gets his first T's agent, won't we'll settle. So kind of a mismatch there, what Tom's saying there, but we want T Higgins too. Yeah. I mean, it's and and, and the year after Jamar Chase. So th that's the thing. You don't know exactly what the salary cap is going to be the following year, but it always goes up. Uh, but it is, it's, it's a quandary. There's no doubt. Um, you, you, you've got the highest paid quarterback in the National Football League who's earned that to be the highest paid quarterback in the National Football League. I guess until the next one, the next good good quarterback, his contract comes due. But, um, you know, with that, there's, there's a ripple effect. And it's a puzzle. And there's only so many pieces to the puzzle. And as Mike Brown has always said during negotiations, there's a pie. And your piece of the pie is this. And then your piece of the pie can't be more than this. And, and that's, that's the way it's got to be. So yeah, it's uh, you can't, you can't just continue to to print money at some point, the bill has to be paid. <laughs> and kind of leading into PB's ghost says, Hey, let's not forget about DJ reader either. Oh yeah. DJ readers uh, contract is, is coming due. And, and at some point, who's the odd man out? Who's the guy that's going to be left out? Or will it be uh, a group of guys may get together and say, you know, maybe we all take a little bit less so we can remain teammates and keep this intact and, and, uh, and, and run it back. Uh, it, it, that would be rare. Agents wouldn't like that because honestly, it's not just the player's ego where players want to be paid from an ego standpoint. Agents want to be known as the guy that got the best deal for his client because they're always soliciting additional clients. 
And the best way to get new clients is to take care of your current clients to the, to the best of, the, of your ability. And they're looking to get as big a contract as they possibly can for the benefit of their client and for their own benefit to benefit their own business. Believe me, that's the case. All right. So this is the last call to get some questions in if you have them, because probably in the next five minutes, we're going to have to go because we have two big yeah. interviews. One of the rookies. Andre, you... Andre, Andre Yossi Vash, wide receiver extraordinaire. Be catching up with, uh, with Andre. And, and, and he, he just, he just had himself a, uh, an outstanding, outstanding camp. I mean, when, he, when he got drafted, there were traits. I mean, this guy, He's a track and field star, can pull vault 15, 16 feet, can run a sub 4, 440. I mean, all of these traits can long jump, can broad jump. He can run, he can jump. He's okay. The question was moving from the Ivy League competition at Princeton to the National Football League. That was the only doubt as such. He has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that he can handle that rise in competition level. This guy is not a track and field athlete trying to play football. This guy is a football player that had the skill set to be a good track and field athlete. And they're night and day difference. Uh, so yeah, we're going to catch up with him and uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good basketball coach as well. Dan Hurley. Uh, that's, that's national, that's champions. national champs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I'm, huge, huge Bengals fan. How about his dad? Hall of Fame high school coach and senior. His brother Bobby won a national championship as a player at Duke. And now Dan, national championship coach at UConn. That is the first family of basketball. The Hurley family is the first family of basketball. And we're going to catch up with, with Dan Hurley, who, yeah, he loves his Bengals now. That's great. He's, he's excited. Yeah, that's good. That's going to be fun. Levi, Levi has a question here. And, and Dave, you've seen the, you've seen, Joe Goodberry's Bengals on the Brain hats uh -huh. and his book. I mean, you use the book yeah. that he put out that First Star sent to a bunch of people. And you can go to firststarlogistics.com and download a digital copy. But he wants to know about getting some Bengals on the Brain fitted hats. <laughs> uh, we, we've been telling you all during this live stream, you got to be checking First Star Logistics Twitter and the First Star go. Media Group YouTube channel because there might be some of that stuff coming out. I, I, I can't go into too much because I want to speak out of place. Right. But it's, it's I've gotta heard. Be, got to be part of the Bengals giveaway package. You've gotta be, I would you know? think so. Yeah, I mean, it's all Bengals they're, all the they're time. They're neat hats. I mean, I've got a couple bucket hats. And <laughs> I know a couple other people we work with here have some All my hats. hats are bucket hats because I got a bucket head. <laughs> um. All right. So Jeremy Swanson wants to know, what do you guys think of all QBs getting paid a set percentage of the cap? You kind of talked about oh, yeah, that. Yeah. No new contracts. Same for all QB ones. Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, I, I, I think, I don't think that should be quarterbacks should be compensated the exact same. I, it, but I do think that if if a quarterback in the, in the franchise can come to an agreement that X percentage of the cap is handleable for the franchise on a year to year basis, and better quarterbacks have a higher percentage than. Other quarterbacks. I mean, if you've got a, you know, a, a four-time MVP, and you got a guy that's coming in as a rookie, they should not be getting the same percentage of their team salary cap. Um, but whatever that agreed upon number is, and and then you can maybe say, okay, we could maybe tweak it a percent or two based on where the salary cap goes the following year. I think tying it into a percentage like that, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, and then. You don't have to worry about okay, what's the number of the following year? It's just it's baked right into the into the uh, salary cap that way for you. I think potentially it would make some sense, but I don't know. I think I think everybody's looking for the the free enterprise. If you have an unbelievable season, even you know even if you're getting X percentage of the cap, which is a high percentage, if you have an MVP type season, you win a Super Bowl for your team. Not going to be satisfied with whatever that number is. There's no doubt. There's always going to be cases where a guy um, outplayed his contract, or man, he's getting paid way too much for the level of play he played last year. So there's never a perfect system. That's for sure. 
Talking to Joe Burrow, Matt Jenkins, when do you think Joe gets back to practice? Well, I'm hoping that maybe he does something this week, but if not, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to be Wang Chunged about it. Uh, I think that he will practice before the Cleveland Browns game. That week of practice before they head up to Cleveland, uh, and I'm not sure he'll practice before Labor Day necessarily, but he'll practice that week. He will definitely get on the football field and get snaps that, that week in preparation for the Cleveland Browns if, in fact, he, he wants to hope to play in that, uh, in that Cleveland game. Yash wants to know, Dave, I need to send you some bucket hats, some with English <laughs> heritage, cricket. Should I get them in extra large? Oh, man. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know how big a bucket you have, but the biggest bucket I need I need for this bucket head. I'm uh I definitely I definitely have a king cranium skull. Dolores says, thanks, Slap and Dave. I love this channel. Who day, babe? Who day, Dolores? All right, Dave, is this the year the Bengals win the Super Bowl? Oh, I'll tell you, the, the AFC is stacked. The AFC is stacked. In my mind, 12 of the 16 teams in the AFC can win the Super Bowl. It's going to be a lot of close football games. Barring injury, knock on wood, barring injury, the Bengals should be right in the hunt. There's no question. All right, Dave, I think this is the end. Last word says we, I mean, it's hard to believe we're here. Roster cuts today, yep. which means a little over a week from now, you're going to be in Cleveland. Yes. Looking to start the season a little different than a year ago. And honestly, the Bengals have lost five of the last six games played against the Cleveland Browns. They've lost five of the last six. The only win in that six-game stretch was in Cincinnati. And remember Halloween last year up in Cleveland? It wasn't. It was not, not pretty. It might have been the worst game the Bengals had last year. So they're going to have to, uh, you know, shake shake off any and all of that. New season, new team, new matchups. Got to go get it done on the road. Division win on the road in Cleveland would be awesome. Before we go, Dave, here's the thing. You had a chance to go up to the Hall of Fame for Ken Riley's yep. induction. Uh, so glad to see that finally happen for that family. Mm -hmm. He was a teammate of yours. Another teammate, Dan, the man, I think it was, had a question we didn't really get to. How disappointed Ken Anderson didn't get that call this year? I know he he ended up like sixth, I think, in in the voting for uh, for for Hall of Fame consideration overall this year, uh, and. I know he's. I know he's disappointed. He's classy, so he'll never register any disappointment. You know, all he'll do is congratulate guys that got into the Hall of Fame because they all they're, they're all Hall of Fame worthy players. But in my mind, it's the quarterback position is a premium position, and as a former teammate of Ken's, I know all of us feel the same way. Damn, if we didn't have that goal line stand against the 49ers, that they didn't stop us. In that uh, in that Super Bowl 16, he'd be in the Hall of Fame. There are a lot of quarterbacks that never won a Hall, never won a Super Bowl that are in the Hall of Fame. But in my mind, that would be the tiebreaker, because you know, you asked. I've talked to Anthony about this, and he's asked people, "What is it? What's the reason? What's the rub? Why is Kenny not in the Hall of Fame?" All these voters, they don't have an answer. Don't have an answer. So in my mind, it's a tragedy. It really is. And I've said it many times. Let's end it with this. A lot of quarterbacks have played in the NFL, a lot of great ones, and a lot of they're all in the Hall of Fame, a lot of these great ones. None of them, none of them won passing titles back to back years in two different decades, 70s and 80s, shows excellence and sustaining a level of excellence to win back to back passing titles in two different decades. And he, it wasn't like did it in 89 and 91. He did it in 74 and 75, and then in 81 and 82, and had great years in between. So it's like he was consistently amongst the best in the National Football League, win four passing titles in general. I'm not sure how many quarterbacks that are in the Hall of Fame have won four passing titles. Never mind doing it back-to-back -back in two different decades. Come on now. It's a travesty. 
let him enjoy it. The thing that I felt most sad about with Kenny Riley was he wasn't here to enjoy it with his family. Let Kenny Anderson enjoy it with his family, please. Everybody, we want to thank you for being Dave. Over 200 people took time out of their busy day, nice. their lunch time to be you. with us. We appreciate that. Again, we're making some changes. First Star Media Group, be watching that YouTube channel because Joe Goodberry's there. Great content from him yep. every week, a couple times a week. And also Malik Wright, State of the Jungle is going to be going over there. I think they're doing a live stream tonight at seven o'clock. And then we still have in the trenches. But we're going to be moving stuff slowly over at some point in time. That way we make one big channel with a ton of Bengals content for everybody to enjoy. The giveaways, giveaways, giveaways. Again, we can't say enough about what First Star Logistics does for us here, the studio. We got news on that coming around the first of the year, too. <laughs> we can't say too much. There you but go. Uh, some new uh, studio digs coming. Uh, so if Yash comes in 2024, he's going to see the new studio. <laughs> How about that, Yash? Whoa. So strong. But, but we want to thank everybody being with us. We've got some great interviews coming up this week. DJ Reader, I think, was one that's coming up for tomorrow, maybe. Tomorrow. Uh huh. And then um, Yosh and then Dan Hurley, as we talked about. And then will be game week, which means a lot of interviews, keys to the game, all that good stuff. So, Dave, I'll let you close it out and we're out of here. All right. Yeah. We're going to be uh, getting after it. Got a couple of podcasts coming up. Andre Yosivash, great wide receiver, rookie out of Princeton. He's turned a lot of heads. He'll be a big contributor on special teams for Darren Simmons as well. And UConn National Championship head coach, Dan Hurley. Let's go. Let's go, Dave. Let's All go. righty. We're out of here. Till next time. Thanks for Star Logistics. Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team.